Thanks, Ariva, for coming. It's a great pleasure to be for once the guest as well as the host. And uh, most people know me because I'm here and I'm running the space and trying to work with the pub to keep the pub going and to keep this place lively. Um, apart from that, I'm an artist and have been involved in academic or scholarly work that's mainly to do with art history. But it seems to me to do that thoroughly, then one's got to get involved in other kinds of history, theory, politics, and the rest of it. Um, the present talk stems from some research I did in connection with an international necronautical society. It's on. Yeah. Um, Can you spell it out? Necronautical? International Necronautical Society, which is the invention of Tom McCarthy, the novelist, who, when I first got to know him, was an unpublished novelist and really pissed off about it. So he decided he wasn't going to write any more novels, but he'd mess around in the art world and invent some kind of fictitious uh, avant-garde movement, uh, which he called the INS. So I got roped into that and eventually became the chief of propaganda, with my full title is chief of propaganda, archiving and epistemological critique. So that explains how this organization works, that their history is entrusted to their propagandist and if you need evidence of any past activities of INS, then I shall produce it for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this relates to our project in Berlin, which uh, we thought we ought to keep an eye on Berlin, so we designated the world capital of death. And uh, so my, my work was part of the INS inspectorate in Berlin, and I carried out aerial surveillance. But that, that will, may or may not become clear, it's not necessarily important. Um, so the what I'm going to talk about, what this, this publication that I made, which is called the dossier, submitted in evidence. Um, there's some copies of it there you can take home for a donation to the function room and to RAG. Um, so it's really a kind of polygomenon to a necronautical materialist study, which this lecture might advance a little bit. Uh, and your response. It also has to do a little bit across with some work I've done on Walter Benjamin, who was a contemporary of Rosa Luxemburg, a little bit younger. Um, he kind of lived through this whole era that, that, uh, in which Rosa Luxemburg was killed, um, but not, he survived till 1940. Um, very interesting thinker coming from a, you know, people argue whether he was a Marxist or a religious thinker, um, and he's written some very weird texts that some of you might know. There's two in particular that would have relevance. This one is The Critique of Violence, which was written in 1920, kind of amid the um, right-wing coup attempt that happened in Germany in 1920, and the other important text is 1926, um, Zum Planetarium, which is the last part of Einbahnstrasse. Um, so those, if you know those, keep those in mind. Um, and by way of introduction, once what I wanted else to say is, um, what's the point, really? Um, so what I want to do, and why I'd like, why I was kind of keen to do it, is to bring a somewhat obscure or kind of unimportant part of radical history um, into a situation where we can look at it with an anthropological alertness. So, in a way, I'm relying on a lot of people here know more about Marxist history than me and know more about anthropological tenets, ways of thinking, ways of observing. So, in a way, I want to put that in front of you and just to kind of highlight some of the themes. I'm going to be sticking to to the facts as far as I'm able to assemble them. But it's worth mentioning a few themes that, that we've heard quite a lot about in this room in the Tuesday nights. So we're talking about the body and the blood, the color red. We're thinking about notions of time. So there's a kind of historical time, which we're used to when we think about Marxism and what we expect from it. And there's also a cyclical time which we think about when we talk about the kind of cosmic aspects of, of um, human culture and observation. 
So the notion of revolution that we have is a kind of cosmic return, as well as having a notion in it of a, of a kind of rupture in history. So those two things, we can see whether they're reconcilable at all, if so and how, and that's something I'd like to advance in the discussion. So the notion of revolution, its relation, like that coming around, is that also repetition? How, and we can also think about other forms of repetition and how they, they might uh, kind of influence our interpretation of, of history, and we decide how we can look at history as something that goes around or something that progresses. So in a way, one of the things that we've, we've learned in this series, the, the Bragg Talks, is how millions of years of evolution and the kind of progressive um, notion of time is kind of swept away by just a few centuries <coughs> of progress. So, in a way, the idea of revolution that, that, that you talk about in relation to kind of human evolution, that this has a kind of a very sudden and uh, disruptive event in the kind of orderly history of the world somehow, if that's plausible, um, then also has to return as a way of, of overcoming the kind of destruction of everything that evolution has, has brought us. Um, so, Rosa, um, probably needs no introduction here. Um, there she is, fearsome revolutionary. Um, and since I'm going to talk mainly about her posthumous career, I thought I may as well start with the eulogy. And this is a eulogy by Leon Trotsky, which was published in 1971 in English in this pamphlet. Um, and this was a speech he gave just days after the, uh, that she and uh, her comrade Karl Liebknecht were killed. And he writes, small in height, frail, with a noble cast of face and beautiful eyes which shone with intelligence, she was striking for the courage of her thought. The Marxist method she mastered completely, as if it were an organ of her body. You could say that Marxism was in her blood. That's just the impression you got chatting with Rosa, reading her articles, or hearing her speak from the rostrum against her enemies. How they hated her. And how she scorned them. Small in height, frail in build, she dominated the Congress from the rostrum, like the incarnation of proletarian revolutionary thought. But the force of her lo by the force of her logic and the power of her sarcasm, she silenced her most sworn enemies. Rosa knew how to hate the enemies of the proletariat, and for that very reason, she could arouse their hatred of her. She was marked out by them beforehand. In the force of her theoretical thinking and in her capacity for generalization, Rosa Luxemburg was head and shoulders above not only her enemies but also her comrades. She was a genius. Her style, terse, exact, brilliant, merciless, was and will ever remain a true mirror to her thought. Indeed, the reaction could have chosen no worthier victims. That's meaning Liebknecht and Luxembourg. What a well-aimed blow, and no wonder. Reaction and revolution knew each other well. For reaction this time was embodied in the person of the former leaders of the former party of the working class, Scheidemann and Ebert, whose names will forever be inscribed in the black book of history as the shameful names of the organizers responsible for this treacherous murder. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, are you willing to stand up? Because I, I agree. I can't okay. hear. I can't yeah, hear. happily. Thank you. Right. Thank you. This blood will set the pavements of Berlin talking, and the bricks of that same Potsdamer Square on which Liebknecht first raised the banner of insurrection against the war and against capital. And one day, sooner or later, on Berlin streets, barricades will be raised from those bricks against the real grovelers and chain dogs of bourgeois society, against the Scheidemanns and Eberts. Right. And the final part. Do you know the basis of the legends about the eternal life of saints? It is people's need to preserve the memory of those who stood at their heads, who in one way or another led them. 
the striving to eternalize the personality of the leaders in an aura of sanctity. We, comrades, have no need of legends. We have no need to transform our heroes into saints. For us, the reality in which we are living now is enough. For that reality itself is legendary. It is awakening miraculous forces in the spirit of the masses and of their leaders. It is creating magnificent figures which tower over the whole of humanity. Right? So that's Trotsky's assessment of uh, um, Rosa. And going stepping back to her death, what are the circumstances in which she was, she was killed? Um, the November days in Berlin, this is right at the end of the, world, the First World War, with uh, the army, German army, uh, about to be defeated and a rapid collapse of authority. It started with a mutiny of sailors in the, in the port of Kiel, which quickly spread revolutionary turmoil um, throughout Germany. Um, the rulers and generals made themselves scarce. The emperor abdicated before any orderly succession could be arranged. The ruling classes pushed the SPD into the Social Democratic Party, into the forefront of the new regime, and left them with the task of forestalling, forestalling a proletarian revolution. So, and the SPD, they took on this task with uh, amazing uh, alacrity. So, um, with the responsibility of parliamentarians schooled in absolute monarchy. So the German parliament, which the SPD had gradually gained its kind of some uh, numerical, I don't know what you call it. So basically the parliament was ignored by the, the emperor anyway. So they kind of lived in a bubble of, of illusory democracy in which they thought they were the, the leaders of the working class and had brought them into a situation where of immense progress. And yes, there was some progress in German industry and working conditions, which was more or less destroyed during the war, which they supported in 1914. So you remember Karl Liebknecht, he was the only parliamentarian who stood up against the, the, the voting of credits for the war. Um, within hours of, of the of the emperor abdicating, then the republic was declared twice. Once by Philip Scheidemann, who just heard about in the Black Book. And he had to go out on the balcony of the Reichstag, the parliament building, to, to speak to the crowd. And he was a bit afraid, so he declared a republic, and he thought that would please them. And his other thought behind that was to forestall actually another declaration of a republic, which was made just around the corner by Karl Liebknecht, who had already occupied the royal palace and spoke from the balcony of the royal palace and declared a socialist republic. Um, so Liebknecht was the leader of the Spartacus group, which was a very small group of kind of underground radicals who had only just recently split from the SPD. And uh, so this is the kind of instant understanding of a revolutionary mood and the declaration of, of, of the revolution despite the fact there was absolutely no organization behind him. And, but what it did is it brought the, the kind of revolutionary socialists into an open contest for the state with the, the majority, you know, the, now the regime socialists. Um, so the political nature of that conflict is important for the subsequent history, um, but obviously the contest was rather one-sided. On the one hand, the Spartacus captured the revolutionary mood, they were, though they were few in number and without any national organization or structure that was capable of leading a revolution or prosecuting a, a revolutionary war or a class war, actually to victory. Not to mention the rifts that divided the, the left um, and the leadership. Um, so there was no policy, there was no organization, there was no real aim except to, to kind of go with the flow. Um, on the other hand, the SPD were handed the apparatus of the state and they could rely on enthusiastic support from the old regime's elite troops um, 
uh, for operations against proletarian revolt. So they were completely at one with the ruling class in that they simply did not want a social proletarian revolution. Um, and that eventually decided the fate of the revolution. In Berlin, and I'm only going to speak of Berlin, there were several episodes of street fighting punctuated by protest strikes, demonstrations, and funeral processions. So this is the first of the, the great funeral processions of, of the November Revolution, which followed um, the first wave of street fighting. And there you can see um, the inscription, this contemporary postcard, Begräbnis der Revolutionsopfer. So that's a particular locution in, in German that, that we would translate as victims of the revolution. But the notion Opfer in German is, carries the notion of, of it's the same word for sacrifice. So kind of to be a victim of the revolution um, is also to be a sacrificial victim. And this is something that I want to, to, to think about throughout the, what follows. Um, the SPD leaders, they showed up to this funeral looking a little bit nervous. Um, and, uh, which one, which one? well, I don't know. The thing is, you see, one, one's wondering about all the hats, really. Um, Isn't the guy with the glasses hill fitting? Yeah, so this we need, like, the, to send it back to the, <coughs> to the Office of Identification. <laughs> so, okay. um, anyway, that's the, the, the inscription tells me those are the, the members of the, the regime. By in the Tower Fire, which is the mourning festival um, or funeral. Um, so that procession led to the Friedhof der Märzgefallenen, which is the, the burial site where the, the, the people who died during the 1848 revolution, March 19, 1848. And that has already been a pilgrimage site for German socialists. So there, there is a tradition already of, of the gravesite being the, 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 the place to go to give honor to those, the dead. Um, there's Karl Liebknecht giving the funeral oration with one foot in the grave. And um, he probably um, was thrilled to be there. Um, so this, this site is quite, you could do another lecture on the, this, this cemetery. Um, which is recently, like a lot of monuments that were in the former East Germany, has been taken over by conservative uh, revisionists, and they want to kind of remodel the, the thing and update it, because the, the current iteration is, is, the, is the DDR version of the, this, this cemetery. And they, they made this proposal that um, they wanted to demonstrate the importance of individuals for democracy through the example of the cemetery. Right. So, in a way, what, the, I mention that because it, it's, it's preposterous in a way, but it does show then this kind of, kind of right-wing liberal interpretation of, of these, these uh, revolutionary moments. And one can argue about the 1848 revolution, which is also a flop. But um, it's just interesting how there's a, a kind of a shared devotion to, to, to the dead and a willing to kind of wish to recapture the, the bodies of the dead for whatever ideology is seems to they can get away with um, right so not long after that um, there was a grand congress which is is here where all the Soviets that had uh, spontaneously sprung up around Germany were, were brought together and more or less destroyed by the SPD so there, there was a strong um, Council's movement, Workers and Soldiers Councils, and uh, they did manage to capture power in this kind of vacuum of authority that, that took place after the end of the war. There was also enough armed, trained workers to kind of enforce that up to a point. And the SPD's tactic was to infiltrate that because the most workers and voters had no idea that the SPD were not revolutionaries after they declared the republic. Um, so the, they managed to kind of steal the, the councils um, at a very early stage. That didn't stop people coming out onto the streets. Um, and 
there was more fighting in December, and this is the aftermath of that. So this, that's the, up at the top there is the balcony where Karl Liebknecht made his declaration, formerly used by the emperor for declaring war and all that kind of stuff. And this building was occupied by revolutionary sailors, and they were basically ousted by the, the, these right-wing militia known as the Freikorps. Um, so they were holed up there, that's where they died, and the undertakers, undertakers came and, and brought the coffins, and these coffins then were, were ready for the next so funeral. Those, those are sailors? Are these killed. are the, the revolutionary sailors killed by the Freikorps. whose coffins were, were prepared in the palace itself, and then they were brought out for, the, for, the, for their final procession. So that's kind of after... Um, so, yeah, so after the fighting, then you get the big demo with uh, the funeral procession. Here's Karl Liebknecht, again, addressing the dead in the Sieges Alley, um, the Victory Alley uh, Avenue. Um, and around this time was the formation of the Communist Party. So the Communist Party of Germany was only formed and there had been a second wave of fighting during the fighting, and it was very difficult for them to, to stop it happening and very difficult for them to control it or to, to actually make any kind of retreat and survive. So the Communist Party was, was kind of born and died at the same moment. Um, and if, you know, I, I've said that, that, that the Communist Party is already dead. I'm not the first person to say that. Um, so here then, Coming after the New Year, January fighting broke out again, and this was a provocation from the SPD because they knew that the communists, uh, they'll have to come out and fight, so let's provoke them, bring them out before they've got any organization, slaughter them because they had their fry courts waiting. So there are the Spartacists, as they were called, defending the, that's the newspaper building that they occupied, and these are the government troops on the other side. So you can see it's a little bit one-sided. You've got a few rifles against captured <laughs> tanks, flamethrowers, machine guns, the whole lot. Um, so basically, with, with that kind of force, there wasn't really much to, um, to win. So the infamous day, 15th of January, just soon after the fighting, um, the KPD, the Communist Party leaders, were, were, were arrested and, and killed. Um, so, just going back to the FICOR here, those fellows, yeah. So they, they weren't only involved in military operations, um, but also police actions against suspected Spartacus and political murder. So they, 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 they didn't re they were supposedly under orders from, from the SPD leadership, who were the, the regime, but they had their own agenda and were quite enthusiastic about uh, making their own decisions about summary executions and so on. Um, so apparently the, when the Spartacus in the Forvets building surrendered, they went out with a white flag and they were simply shot. Um, okay, 15th of January is the day that sticks in everybody's mind. Um, and it's been celebrated ever since. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stories about how this occurred, the, the, the capture and murder, and it's not really important. But does anyone want me to just say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so the, the, the KPD leadership had to go into hiding, but they didn't really want to, and they were kind of urged to, to kind of be a little bit more discreet, otherwise they're just going to get picked up, um, which they were eventually anyway. Um, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht were together in an apartment in West Berlin, something like a bourgeois district. Um, Peek, Wilhelm Peek, who we all know is later president of the DDR. Um, he was a comrade. He was with them at the time. He was also arrested. So they were taken and, and interrogated at the kind of temporary headquarters of the Freikorps uh, unit that was uh, commissioned to do this. And um, then they were taken out and killed. And the, they, it was announced that, that Karl Liebknecht was, was shot while trying to escape. And uh, there was... They also claimed that they didn't really know what happened to, to Rosa Luxemburg. There was a fracas and she disappeared. Anyway, the, the Liebknecht's body was taken to the morgue uh, without an identification. And um, Luxemburg's body was thrown into the canal. So <coughs> all quite close to each other in, the, in Berlin, near the in West Berlin. Uh, what was... So 
So I count that as, that as burial number one. So, so the, the, the body is thrown into the canal and it stayed there for quite some time. Um, so, of course, the next thing that happens is a tremendous um, funeral procession for the great leaders and uh, quite a few others who were, who were killed at the same time. Um, the USPD was the, the independent socialists who were a little bit left of, of the, the majority socialists. They called a, a, a protest strike and one of their leaders is quoted saying, the funerals were the most impressive mass demonstrations that Berlin has ever seen. Okay. But the, the coffin of, of Rosa Luxemburg here is empty because the body was still in the canal. And uh, nonetheless, the procession had to go on. And they were taken not to the, to the, to the Friedhof der Merzgefallenen, um, but to another place in Lichtenberg, in the eastern part of Berlin, where they were given a plot in the farthest corner of the cemetery. So what they wanted to do was to take the socialist graves as far away as possible from the center of the city. But nonetheless, you had a demonstration that was starting. Um, and in the center of Berlin, um, where the, the Volksbühne is, now called Rosa Luxemburg Platz, all the way to Lichtenberg. Um, and that was the high point of the revolution. Here's the open grave with Liebknecht, Luxembourg, and 30 other Revolutionsopfer. So just a few days after the death, then Leo Jorgisches, the Rosa Luxemburg's partner, he wrote a telegram to Lenin, and he said Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht have carried out their ultimate revolutionary duty. So he lasted about a, maybe a two months before he was picked up and killed and found his resting place next to, to Rosa Luxemburg's empty coffin. Um, and around that time, the Eugen Levine, who was another Marxist leader, revolutionary socialist, who was involved with the Bavarian Socialist Republic that lasted a few days, um, he was picked up and not long before his own death, he remarked, that the Social Democrats start, then run away and betray us. The independents fall for the bait, join us, then let us down, and we communists have stood up against the war. We communists are all dead men on leave. Right? So that was his, his final speech in the court case that led to his execution. And uh, um, that's the, the telegram. So March 10th was his death. Um, and about 31st of May, according to, to, to testimonies, a body was recovered from, from the canal. Um, and then it was identified, questionably it turns out, um, and placed in a ceremonial coffin. And this is the, the coffin for Rosa Luxemburg's third burial. Um, okay. And this is a nice summer demo where everyone's got straw hats instead of the top hats, and, and that, which is also very well attended. Um, here, important people with top hats, and a big wreath that says, Unsere Liebe Rosa, our beloved Rosa. Um, this is an interesting banner. So there you've got the, the face of uh, um, Rosa Luxemburg as an icon, and the inscription there, which you can hardly read, is, is ich bin, uh, ich war, ich bin, ich werde sein. I, I, I was, I am, I will be, which is, was the final words of the last article that she wrote in, in Portofana, the communist newspaper, which was entitled Order Reigns in Berlin, and was a, a kind of on-the-go assessment and pep talk for demoralized socialists and communists. So this... Um, phrase we'll see now often. And where did she get it from? From this um, um, this is a kind of ode to the revolution by um, a certain Feiligrat. Um, so so this, this inscription Ich war uh, Ich bin Ich, ich war, ich bin, ich werde sein Concluded 
the last published article, and the line comes from Die Revolution by Ferdinand Feiligrad, um, which was a, a revolutionary ode from the published in 1886. So in the context of this poem, the prophetic theological overtones were not played down. The bibli biblical, though it sounds, the line appears to have been circulated in the 18th century. Kant, or Kant as we should call him, cites, cites it as the well-known inscription upon the Temple of Isis and claims it as the most sublime utterance of the aesthetic idea. And he quotes that in his critique of aesthetic judgment. Um, so Kant appears to have got it from Schiller, who quotes it in The Mission of Moses, 1790, and apparently Beethoven copied the inscription and had it under glass on his desk. So this kind of mystical, cosmic idea is, is one that has been circulating since the 18th century and is attributed to this kind of, um, what at the time was thought of as kind of the or history in Egypt, the Temple of Isis. Um, well, there it is in formal script. Um, so, meanwhile, things didn't really improve for the Spartacists, um, and the sacrifices continued. Um, and the burial ground in the Friedrichsfeld in Lichtenberg um, that swallowed more victims. Um, So around that time, the, the, the leadership is gone. There's a few inexperienced people. The Russians think they ought to sort this out finally. So the German Communist Party and other kind of hard left is, is taken under the uh, protection of the Comintern and they are sent advisors and all sorts of good people who want to prove themselves in Moscow. So um, meanwhile, we can think about this comment of de Tocqueville from 1848, which uh, kind of sums up what, uh, what <laughs> you yeah, if you're going to try it on, you know, you've got to organize the police first, you know, like the, um, So that, that kind of went this on. Is so this is reminiscent of Bismarck's comment on, uh, or Schleswig Holstein, when he said, if the British army lands on the coast of Schleswig Holstein, I will send a policeman and have it arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, so they've always been confident in the police to, to you know, withstand invasion from even other imperial powers, let alone a handful of, of uh, revolutionaries. So, so I won't go into the whole history of the revolution, which is complicated and disputed, um, but it all went in one direction, and in the end, Trotsky himself planned an insurrection, the German October, and uh, it was called off. Yeah. So the signal was supposed to be a call for a strike. All the workers were supposed to stand up and go for the strike, and uh, that would be the signal for the insurrection, and all the preparations would come alive. But when uh, Panda, right, yeah, he, he called the strike, and then, no, we don't want that. You know, no thanks. You know. And you can imagine that's 1923, no money, there's no, you know, there's no stamina for, for, for an extended strike. Um, so... And it's arguable whether they missed their moment or whatever because there was such a lot of turmoil in 1923. But that was the kind of, the, the big thing was called off. And around that time, maybe just afterwards, I'm not really sure, Wilhelm Pieck, who had been arrested together with, with his comrades, and he claims managed to escape. Um, meanwhile, the guy that arrested him said he let him go because he was of quite some assistance to the police. Um, but that's still disputed. Um, he had the idea for a, a monument to the revolution. So at the end of 1923, he had this idea in 1924, on the anniversary of, of Rosa Luxemburg's second funeral, um, they laid a foundation stone for the Revolutionsdenkmal, the monument to the revolution, and they began fundraising by selling postcards like this and like this, which shows a model by Mies van der Rohe, so Mies van der Rohe, the famous modernist architect, he got this gig via Edward Fuchs, who was an art historian and collector, who was also a party member, and somehow got onto the committee, the, the, the Denkmal committee, that Pieck had organized. And uh, 
he showed it to his friend Mies van der Rohe, who, who saw Peake's sketch for the monument and laughed at it. And then he, the next day he got the job to do an impressive um, thing. He also got uh, the, the, the inscription, Ich war, ich bin, ich werde sein, den Toten Helden der Revolution, to the, to the dead heroes of the revolution. And his concept was um, a, um, a brick wall. After all, that's, that's the brick wall that we communists get stood up against. So Mies van der Rohe was briefly a member of the Communist Party, but apart from this, I'm not aware of any other activity that he, he did um, for the Communist Party. He later tried to get work from the, from the Nazis, seeing as they were in charge, um, but that didn't work, so he went to America. Um, so, but there's something ingenious here because apparently uh, the Krupp firm, who he wanted to get the metalwork, to do the metalwork for the star, they would refuse to do that. So he sent them designs just for, the, for these lozenge shapes, five of them, and uh, they, they built that for him. And that was installed there with, along with the flagpole. Um, and that was dedicated in 1926. There's Peak again with his uh, um, a, um, so one of the first. Yeah, so the, the, the party members have funded this. So, of course, there, there, there may be. I, I'm not, there's, there's one book, uh, which is a DDR book, which is the story of the, the Revolutionsdenkmal in the Gedenkstätte. Um, but it, it doesn't really go into details about the, where the money came from. But certainly, members were solicited for, for funds. And then that was the ceremonial site for all the anniversary days and big demos. And here that same inscription is appearing, slightly garbled. Um, um, interesting. And so that's 1928, probably. This is 1929. As part of the fundraising campaign for the upkeep of the memorial, then members were invited to buy this cushion cover showing the, the, the revolution to the monument in a kind of enchanted forest. Um, <laughs> exactly. So um, that's ingenuity there. So uh, this is probably before 1933. The flagpole seems to have gone missing, and that's maybe down to lack of upkeep. Um, curious if anyone recognises the insignia on the on the wreath there. Um, no. Yeah. I mean, it's, and in 1933. Um, was the last legal demo that took place at the Revolution Stank Mal to bury more dead communists, this time killed by the, the, the Nazis. There's Peak looking a little bit fatter, and um, this was the, also the first and the last time that the SPD and the, the KPD stood out together. And more or less the next day, both were, were completely engulfed. Um, um, so that was the kind of last stand of, of socialism um, in Nazi Germany. Um, Peak then made it to Paris, thence to Moscow. So a little bit later, the monument was defaced, and the star showed up and saw a bad reproduction in a, an ironic museum of the revolution where the local SA troop displayed the trophies of their struggle. Um, so that's from the local newspaper. So then you can imagine like this, this burial site, the site of these annual processions, more burials all the time, um, is then is raised to the ground the, the, in 1935. And from then on, then it's completely, the, the marker, the grave marker is gone. But it still was, uh, you know, it didn't lose its power to attract communists. And the Gestapo knew this quite well. So all they had to do was stake it out on the anniversary days, and the, the communists would show up with red carnations, <laughs> and they'd get arrested. So it's, it's pitiable. Um, but there are police reports that say, you know, like their catch for the day. They knew what days they were. You know, they were like May the 1st, January 15th. Um, 
you can you can catch your communist fish easily. Um, so it's kind of then dormant throughout the, the war, apart from the, the kind of intrepid faithful who, who, who will risk anything to show their devotion. Um, but it's one of the first things that in 1945, when the, the, the Communist Party in exile comes back with the Russian troops, uh, Pika is with them, and he's quite keen already to institute the, the, um, the, the restoration of the memorial sites. And he gets the, like there's already a, some kind of Berlin City Council, 1945, that he gets to make a decision in favor of the, the um, reinstitution of the memorial sites, and actually restoration to their original state was the plan. 1946 in January, then they put up a makeshift monument, and then Peak himself again on the rostrum, Ulbricht and you know the rest of them, um, and the, the 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 January demonstrations are, are resuming in, in full swing. Um, April 1946, then you've got this unification of in the Soviet zone of the SPD, KPD, resulting in the uh, Socialist Unity Party. Um, which peak as a co-chair. Um, and the council then, under Peake's influence, announces a, a, a competition for the design of a new monument, the new Revolutionsdenkmal. So, but every year until they've actually decided it, there was a new provisional one, which get more and more elaborate. Um, and the, the demonstration becomes a very important part of the communist calendar. Um, here, this is a march to the burial site, January 15th, in Geister von Rosa Luxemburg und Karl Liebknecht werden wir unsere Pflicht tun. Okay, so in the spirit of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, we will do our duty. All right, so that's the reserve police of the, of the DDR, are going to do their duty. And they would have arrived then at this makeshift monument, complete with a kind of flaming cauldron and all the rest of it. Ulbricht looking very serious. Um, so the, in 1949, um, yeah, 48 already, they'd, they'd announced the winners of the competition. But in 1949, Friedrich Ebert Jr., who I'm presuming is, is the son of the original Ebert from the Black Book of History, um, entreats Peak. Um, soon to be the, the, the president, um, to, to scrap that because we need something for bigger demos, right? So, so then new architects are, are, are um, appointed, but actually it's Peak who's designing everything. And that's his sketch for the, for the new Gedenkstätte der Sozialisten. So this then has to perform unity as well. So this is the kind of the unity that, that meant that the Communist Party did not exist in 1918, then is uh, kind of reinstituted under the kind of the Stalinist SED. Um, and in the middle there is going to be this um, giant menia. Um, and around it, the chief um, dead of, of the socialists and communists and around them that shall be you know the the other old socialists because there were some they moved the, the bodies you know they've got Wilhelm Liebknecht and everything like that um, this is what it looked like a bit later because they had to make room right next to Rosa Luxemburg for Wilhelm Pieck himself for Otto um, what's his name Krotobol who was the the SPD leader who was the co-chair of the SED to begin with and Ulbricht as well so Ulbricht, Pieck, and uh, Kotobol then take their place among the chief um, dead of the communists. They had to push one of them out of the way to do that. Um, and this is what it looked like relatively, that's 2004. Um, so you've got a very cosmic arrangement then of the big circular arena the, where it says Gedenkstätte der Sozialisten. That's the, the tribune where the, the great leaders will, will make their speeches, as we'll see. Um, then this giant porphyry menhir, let's call it politely. Um, and 
the inscription didn't detort and man in uns. The dead admonish us. Where, where's the body? So here. So the, the bodies are arranged around the, 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 the cenotaph. Um, and this is Rosa Luxemburg's grave, but there's nothing in it. Um, because they did try and exhume the bodies from the previous burial site, but they couldn't find them except they claimed to have found the body of Franz Mehring, um, but none of the others could be found. So there's a symbolic scattering of earth from the previous burial site where Rosa Luxemburg's body may or may not have ever been buried <laughs> anyway. And this is then put in there. So this, this granite sarcophagus then is also empty. Um, and there you can see then the echoes of the previous provisional monuments, the, the flaming cauldrons and so on. And here come the, the men in coats. Um, <laughs> So this is the annual procession led by, um, you know who, um, and followed by the workers and soldiers and the great icons of, of, to, to be remembered. And I just noticed that uh, those must be the official portraits, seeing as they appeared also on the cover of the pamphlet which I read from at the beginning, 1971, um, the master, the Third International. So these are the official photos of the official ceremonies which everyone was required to do. And then you can see the inscription again, the dead admonish us, there he is himself. And that tradition um, will sort of gradually change its character from this kind of spontaneous outpouring of <laughs> mourning and revolutionary um, uh, sadness to, you know, a very particular glorification of, of the regime and so on. <laughs> so they had the idea, nonetheless, to, to, to memorialize the Revolutionsdenkmal that had been raised. So that was actually in the um, 1960s, uh, 1967, there was a movement to, to restore or to build a new monument on the site of the old monument, um, which was answered by, in West Germany, in West Berlin, by the call to reconstruct the Revolutionsdenkmal in the Tiergarten. So there was a, that was in 1968. So obviously the, you can see how the fight over the monuments and the bodies is also a, um, a kind of rivalry between the, the kind of the Liberal Democrats in the West and the, 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 the SED in the East. So every move on the east is answered by a move on the west. Um, so this monument was actually only built in 1983, finally, and it's got it's just a little inscription there that says, "On this site stood the, the revolution, the the Revolutionsdenkmal." This is the it's a very little thing, and that's my equipment for surveillance of the site. Um, so that's that's how it stands today. So not long after that was 1987, was the great 750th anniversary of the city of Berlin. So then you can imagine West Berlin and East Berlin have got to uh, make their claims. Here then was the institution of this memorial to the first burial society, which some of you may know, um, by the side of the, the canal where the body was thrown. And it's got the inscription here. It's quite peculiar. They, they were victims of the eines heimtückischen politisches mordes, which means a kind of sneaky or treacherous political murder. So only Germans can find ways to qualify political murders, but this one was treacherous. So, but what, what does that mean in West Berlin 1987 is that, that actually you've got your kind of, your saintly victims, and actually it's the Social Democrats who are to blame. Um, and because they were the treacherous ones. Um, meanwhile, on the other side, you go down to the Gedenkstätte, carrying banners of, of uh, other Berlin monuments that have been restored since the Second World War. Um, and there's the, the Roses monument on actually any day, probably an anniversary day. So that's not the only thing. So that's an official thing. And there's a, there's a quite a lot of activity in Berlin where kind of self-organized, grassroots organized and get official support for um, new monuments. 
to old revolutions and to revisions of old monuments. So here you can see a, a fragment of the, of the Berlin Wall was erected in the middle of Potsdamer Platz after it had been rebuilt, this is 2004, this photo, um, as a memento of the, the Berlin Wall and the celebration of the kind of capitalist infrastructure that's the grown up around it. So the shape of the thing, of course, like a, a gravestone, there becomes the site of a, what this artist called a Gedenk Graffiti, which means a memorial graffiti with this implausible uh, inscription, Ich bin eine Terroristin, um, which the artist called paradoxical, although it just doesn't make any sense. But it, it, it could have been... Um, yeah, so that means I'm a female terrorist. Um, so it may have been intended to associate Luxembourg with Ulrike Meinhof and possibly an attempt to return the funeral compliments paid to the suicide RAF leader that compared her to Luxembourg. So the artist of this cites the poet Erich Fried who gave a eulogy at the grave of Ulrike Meinhof who compared her to, to Rosa Luxembourg. And some people will not find that plausible. Um, um, nonetheless, you can do that in United Berlin. Um, 2006, then there's another kind of revision, a little addition to the Gedenkstätte des Sozialismus. There's another granite thing to the, to the victims of Stalinism. Um, and this then is, is a, a, just a signifier of a, of a constant battle over the, over the monuments, the grave sites, the bodies that may or may not be there. So it was quite a surprise then when in this, this picture was issued in 2009 by the pathologist Michael Tsokos of the Charité Hospital, who claimed to have found this body in the basement of the hospital, um, that he identified as probably the body of Rosa Luxemburg, and he claims to have, uh, have looked at the original documents of the autopsy and found anomalies and that the, the, the pathologist who examined the body would, did not agree about it. So then he's done some examinations and compared it with uh, a little skeletal defect that, uh, that Rosa Luxemburg is said to have had and put out a call for any possible samples to make a DNA match and so on. So there was a chance then of, of kind of recovering the body from that would be the fourth burial, I think, um, in the basement of the hospital. Um, and he gave out press photos like this of the, the serious pathologist doing electronic scans of this object. And this object is, is, the, is the torso. Um, so you've got then a kind of another representation. It was mainly for the vanity of the pathologist, I think, but obviously did, some of you might remember this story from, from 2009, um, kind of evoked the possibility of another funeral, another burial, <laughs> and if only that body could be identified positively, then we would see a tremendous demonstration in, in Berlin again. So I have the suspicion, and it you know, may as well, that of course nobody wanted to make a positive identification, even if it were possible, and Sokos had admitted that he could only make a probable one. So the body is then disposed of anonymously in an unknown place with the rest of the waste from the hospital, and the, the kind of the body is then forever missing. But what you have then is this thing, what, what would happen? Does it want a burial or does it want a monstrance? So somehow there should be, you know, you've got this peculiar halo around the, the, the object there, the relic of the saint. And the other figure it, it evoked for me was, was, was this, so where the body from the canal is kind of reconfigured as a river god. This is... Uh, by my, modeled by Michelangelo of a river god for one of his uh, funeral sculptures, um, and as a heroic torso. So the torso signifying like the 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 um, that kind of classical heroism that is really actually a neoclassical heroism because you're digging up those relics of the past to put on your pedestal as a torso. So. In conclusion, 
All I wanted to, to add was, was the kind of provisional conclusions that I submitted to the INS committee. Um, in the course of the inspection, I highlighted two tropes likely to be of importance in dealing with Berlin, namely failed revolutions, empty tombs. The committee has advised that these phenomena are closely bound together. Um, the historical recurrence in Berlin of failed revolutions and empty tombs appears to result from their entwining. The multiplication of Revolutionsdenkmäle, and I've also discussed in this document, um, for example, there's a monument to a failed uprising in 1953, which was celebrated in the West, mainly because it failed and the West didn't have the courage to intervene in that, um, and also the, the Fried of the Metzgefallenen. So the multiplication of, of revolutionary monuments or monuments to revolutions in the city where no revolution succeeded, their replicas, replacements and reminders suggest how the revolutionary impulse is converted into a cult of death which congeals around monuments and whose most effective expression is the empty tomb, that is to say a hungry sarcophagus whose appetite for bodies demands the repeated immolation of victims for the sake of the tomb, not the revolution. In turn, the monument underwrites the romantic revolutionary's fulfillment in martyrdom, not transformation. While dreaming of his body draped in revolutionary colours, the romantic raises his shroud above the barricades, which is from the song The Red Flag, which I probably don't need to remind everybody here, but the people's flag is deepest red. They're shrouded off to our martyred dead, and ere their limbs grew stiff and cold, their heart is every fold. Then raise the scarlet standard high, with its shade we'll live and die. Right, 1889. Um, the revolution is I as ideal, is to die for. But it may not be achieved. Death sanctifies the ideal and its non-realization. The cult of death thus secures the idealist project and unites revolutionaries and reactionaries in its rights. The numerous memorials in Berlin to KBD founders Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht are a case in point. Their deaths and the failure of the revolution they hoped to ignite were celebrated in both capitalist West and communist East Germany's. Their names adorn places where they were murdered, buried, and reburied, the places where their statues were not erected, as well as the houses, streets, and squares. Moreover, whereas Lenin, victorious in revolution and in civil war, was erased from the map of Berlin after 1990, Liebknecht and Luxembourg's fame survived the so-called collapse of communism. Their names are invoked as their corpses might be exhibited as criminals, victims, or saviors. For the left, they join the martyrs whose deaths purify the cause. For liberals, they are the pathetic victims of the far right, or, as the case may be, of the SPD. Um, although the revolution had to be stopped. While for the right, their killing is justified as a lesson to, to would-be incendiaries and an adornment to the order which reigns in Berlin. Um, right. So, I'll leave it with the order that reigns in Berlin, and thanks for your attention, and I hope I provoked something there. Yeah. Yeah.